I want to live in a city with good transit services that I can rely on. Well, then just move to a bigger city then. No, you can't just do that out of the blue. What else do you suggest that I do? Start my own transit enterprise? Actually, there are a few ways to improve your small transit services. Moving isn't the only solution for enjoying a good transit system. I want to talk about the need for good transit services in smaller cities too, and how agencies of these cities can achieve them using a different approach from bigger cities, which have a reputation of better and more reliable transit. Smaller cities in the context of this video include Canadian cities with a population under 1 million. Yes, I included you too, Winnipeg. Given how big you are compared to the rest of Manitoba, you're still small in my context. And this video also applies to smaller cities that you may have never heard of. Now, you may question why small cities deserve good transit as well. Let me tell you, small cities and communities benefit a lot from good transit for multiple reasons. First off, Smaller cities usually have a smaller area, which means the proximity of things are closer together. Basically, when you live in a smaller city or community, your average distance to all your needs is lower than in a big city. This is a really good catalyst for good public transit, since the community can design a small and compact system that still meet the needs of all their residents. The closer proximity of locations also allow for different types of public transit trips to be taken at different times of the day, and the agency will need less money to operate their system compared to a bigger city. The second reason for small communities to have good transit is the reduction in the need for road maintenance. Small cities and communities have a lower budget for infrastructure compared to bigger cities, and if their road network is constantly damaged by cars and trucks, then the need for maintenance will increase or the road quality will go down over time. And since the budget is fixed, the system will definitely be overloaded with unfixed damages at some point. Eventually, the city will struggle with a lot of infrastructural bills to pay while having to cut budgets on multiple other projects because you can't keep hiking taxes as a band-aid to generate revenue for your city. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Winnipeg. And lastly, there are also disabled people, senior residents, students in small cities too, and they too deserve a fast, safe, and convenient mode of travel. This may not be true for all small cities and communities, but the living expenses in some can be very expensive while the average salary of those in smaller communities may not be as high as in bigger metropolitan areas. In this economy where an average annual cost of a car can be up to $12,000, are you really expecting anyone in a small city have to drive to their needs? Good transit in small cities ensure people have a good way to move around aside from driving or taking cabs, and in the contemporary world where people want to flock to cities with good and convenient infrastructure, they will play a crucial role in retaining people back in the small cities for a long term. Here's a periodic reminder. People don't come to a place just because of the money. It's also about the living condition of the place as well. Okay, but you might watch at this point and say, well, my city is too small for transit. Plus, investing in transit is expensive, and small cities definitely don't have the budget for big transit projects. Before you say anything further, I want to stop you right there. Buying a new 40-foot electric bus, the regular buses you see in cities, is less expensive than widening a mile of major arterial road. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Those numbers aren't adjusted to inflation. Here we go. And that's the cost of electric buses. Diesel and hybrid buses or used buses tend to be cheaper. Mind-blowing, okay? This is just not to mention the construction costs for new road projects. Sometimes, a city can have multiple road widening projects, and I'm not sure if I have to repeat this, but I will. Building just one more lane won't help you make traffic better. Sometimes, a city might not be too small for transit, because it may still have a concentrated area with high population density. What I'm showing on the screen right now is the population density of Edmonton, Alberta, a city of 1.1 million people, and that of London, Ontario, with a population of 400,000. Guess which one belongs to which one? They're not two different numbers, hey? If that's the case, then why doesn't London have three LRT lines like Edmonton? If the demand for transit is too small, then why are the roads clogged with cars? Clearly, many small cities' transit systems aren't designed for moving around, resulting in them being unattractive to encourage more riders. And here's the knot that we're trying to untie, and it's time we roll our sleeves up to do that. The first approach, aka the routes for better transit in small cities, is the acknowledgement of the change of patterns of travel. 
Many small transit systems are designed in a hub and spoke network, which is basically a spider network if you think about that, where buses pick people up from neighborhoods and drop them off at a hub station, like a downtown, a mall, a hospital, university, recreation center. This model is only good when people are traveling from the neighborhoods to these locations exclusively at all times of the day. This is based on the monocentric city model, aka everyone lives in the suburb and works in concentrated central business district. However, this model has drastically changed due to the relocation of offices and businesses to the suburbs and to other neighborhoods scattering across the city. So don't be surprised the next time you see 60 cars lining up to leave the suburb during evening rush hours. Because of this change in travel patterns, transit routes should change for smaller cities as well. It should focus on less transfer and more direct routes from suburbs to suburbs, instead of requiring transfers that add more time and length to the trips. They don't have to be very frequent, like every 5 or 10 minutes, but they need to be active all day to ensure all activities are doable by public transit, and the schedule should be consistent. You might have seen small cities having transit projects like bus rapid transit, express buses, or even light rail transit. And while most of these routes traverse through the central core of the city, the network supporting it should ensure neighborhoods to neighborhoods connection, as well as a good feeding system to those major lines. Here's a reminder before I move on. Waiting is the most hated part of any transit trips, so the more you can minimize it, the better. My next recommendation target the infrastructure for transit services, aka bus lanes, bus stops, signals, fare collections, and accessibility to the bus stop. Even if a city is small, you will still see multiple lane arterials traversing across the city. These arterial roads are bad, but they represent an opportunity to be converted into a bus lane, a bus and taxi lane, or a high occupancy vehicles lane for both transit and carpooling. The goal of transit is to reduce single occupant vehicles, so any reduction from these lanes are reduction. And for small cities, they don't even have to implement these lanes 100% of the time. They can implement them as rush hour only, while other hours implemented as a regular lane. While this is very minimal, having dedicated lanes during the period where there's a high usage of transit users and commuters will significantly improve their experiences and can engage more transit riders to use the service, especially those car users being stuck in traffic seeing a bus passing them by. I also had previous videos on bus stops and fare collection that you can check them out. In the context of small cities, bus stop improvements can first happen at big terminals and then to major corridors depending on their budget. In the end, people want to travel between point A and point B in the fastest, most convenient and safest way possible, no matter the mode. So if you make transit faster during rush hours, more people will take transit. If you make transit terminals safe and comfortable to wait at, people will use transit. If you make the fare affordable and easy to navigate, people will choose to ride the bus and the service will ultimately improve. One point I also want to make. I've seen a lot of people talk about buying smaller buses for smaller cities to cut the cost of operation. While this sounds rational, it is technically not saving by a lot. A small bus is cheaper to procure, but it still requires a driver to operate and mechanics to fix it and maintain it. And opting for smaller bus rather than big buses might signal a short-sighted vision in planning in case a route can increase its ridership. However, small cities should still have its small buses to ensure a flexibility of services between fixed bus and demand responsiveness, which lead to my third recommendation on services. While the network does not have to run frequently all day, increasing the frequency of how many buses on the street during the busiest hour of service and switching to on-demand service after hours and on the weekend can also help with reducing the operational expenses while still ensuring the services for riders. We have seen research from small cities and towns switching their fixed buses to on-demand and resulting in shorter wait time for riders and lowering the expenses for the agency, as well as increasing ridership in a per-hour measure basis. I will link a few case studies below for you to read if you're interested. In the meantime, transit agencies can also adjust the service standards to satisfy the local context of the service. For example, most transit agencies are defining on-time arrival as one minute before to three minutes after the scheduled time. This time is actually very narrow, and in the context of not yet having fully separated transit infrastructures, they can extend this standard to five or seven minutes after the scheduled time just to reduce the stress for their operators. 
transit schedulers should also consider the rest time aka layover time for the operators just to make sure that any delays can be eliminated with this and allow the drivers to rest, have lunch or use the washroom between their shifts. The utilization of technology for riders comfort is also super appreciated. You might have seen apps like Transit or Google Maps helping riders with real-time information for Transit. However, this requires data and gatekeep people who cannot afford a good data plan to access this information. Lo and behold, let me introduce you to this service, Text for Real Time, where riders can just send a text to a number and receive the information about the real-time arrival time of their next buses. This program costs anywhere between 270,000k to 1.6 million to procure for a small transit agency with 300 vehicles or less and about another 140k per year to operate in the US, although the number might be much different now since this paper I found was from 2006. But my point is, this should be an investment to attract more riders as the availability of real-time information can significantly help riders on extreme cold or hot days and everyone deserves to access it not only those who are paying ridiculously high amounts for phone plans with good data. Another point in terms of services is that if a small city is closer to another small city or a big city, then regional connection should be considered. This will help create the demand and services for people to travel between towns, increasing the ability and opportunity for them to find jobs and entertainment. And lastly, the weekend services must be considered. Like I said above, a good transit service ensures all types of trips can be made by transit. A lot of towns and cities can have mediocre or absent late night and weekend service, and that can be changed as well. It does not have to be frequent, but it also should not be an hourly service and ends too early that late night shift workers cannot use it to go home. Here's my personal story. I used to work at Walmart, where it closed at 11pm, and since buses only run until 9pm on the weekends, it's just impossible for me to go home without booking a cab, and cab services are expensive if you work on a minimum wage job, let alone owning a car. So having no reliable services for workers is a way to indirectly push them into poverty, and that should be criminal. Places employing minimum wage workers should be where the transit services are the most convenient. You don't want to barely make any money, but have to spend majority of them on transportation to go home and to work, right? Small cities may not have the best transit infrastructure yet, but one small step by one, the community, the city administration, and transit agencies can improve them slowly. In the end, there are no cities or towns that are too small for good public transit. Any cities or towns that have a significant population should have good and reliable transit for the benefits of their own citizens and for the benefits of their infrastructure bills. You cannot keep building more roads and more cars in this economy but you can transform those roads to accommodate other modes of transportation. And that transformation can start tomorrow so that future generations do not have to move to big cities just to deserve reliable and convenient transit. I'd like to thank all my supporters who support me via my Buy Me A Coffee page. If you'd like to see your names at the end of the video, check out the donation links in the bio. I appreciate any amount that you chip in as making these videos require a lot of efforts research, and also money for articles and books. But you helped maintain my motivation. See you in the next videos.